Hi, I'm Jess, part-time Hobbit, and I'm here to talk to you about Tolkien. As I've worked on videos for this channel, I've noticed an amusing pattern. When I first start editing my videos, I find them absolutely impossible to watch, and I consider just scrapping the entire thing probably every three minutes. This downward spiral comes to a screeching halt the second that I put music under that video. All of a sudden, it's not just me sitting in a room ranting to empty space, it's a YouTube video. The empty space itself takes on a character of its own, filling in the blank spaces that I couldn't. Now, that may just sound like a testament to my own lack of confidence, but I don't think it's unfounded. Music has a profound impact on the human mind, and it was one of Tolkien's most beloved tools. It's a uniting thread across all of his works that knits them together better than any of his other themes. Today, I'm going to guide you on a journey across Tolkien's works, focusing on the way that he uses music as the heartstring of every one of his stories. We are going to be covering a lot of material in this video, so if you lose your place, there will be chapters in the pinned comment down below. I'll also be placing my citations on screen when I'm making a direct quote. A lot of my research came from this collection of essays, so if you'd like to look further into the topic, I highly recommend you check that book out. Tolkien first demonstrates his adoration for music in his creation story of Middle-earth, called the Ainulindale, or the Song of the Ainur. There was Eru, the one, who in Arda is called Iluvatar, and he made first the Ainur, the holy ones that were the offspring of his thought, and they were with him before aught else was made. And he spoke to them, propounding themes of music, and they sang before him, and he was glad. In Tolkien's world, creation is followed immediately by music. Iluvatar's first act is to create his musicians, and so all of his other creations pour out of this initial music that they made. Then the voices of the Ainur, like unto harps and lutes and pipes and trumpets and veals and organs, and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of Iluvatar, to a great music, and a sound arose of endless interchanging melodies woven in harmony, that passed beyond hearing into the depths and into the heights, and the places of the dwellings of Iluvatar were filled to overflowing. And the music, and the echo of the music, went out into the void, and it was not void. When we look into the type of music that the Ainur made, we gain much more insight into the story that Tolkien was trying to tell. The song of the Ainur is something called collective polyphonic improvisation, which sounds like a scary term, but let's break it down. First off, their music is collective. The Ainur are a group of beings who, prior to the song, have no knowledge of each other. Coming together as a group to sing this song is an incredibly important moment then, considering this initial separateness. The second word we're looking at is polyphonic, which means that their music had multiple tones that were playing at once. The Song of the Ainur isn't simply Iluvatar's theme being shouted by thousands of voices in tandem. From the beginning, it is multiple voices interchanging melodies and harmonies, all based around the first theme that Iluvatar propounded. The last part of that term is improvisation. Just like in jazz, the Ainur didn't have sheet music that they were working off of. Their music was spontaneous and new, unrehearsed, and yet in perfect harmony. Collective polyphonic improvisation has a long historical precedence that Tolkien would have been aware of. It likely originated in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Europe, but our earliest written records of the technique come from the 13th century. It began as religious music in Christian monasteries, and it all revolves around the Cantus Firmus. The Cantus Firmus is a fixed melody that all of the singers already knew. The Cantus Firmus of each song was never changed, and its stability allowed the singers to improvise polyphonic harmony around it. I'm gonna play a short clip of Gregorian chant, one of the most popular types of collective polyphonic improvisation, so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about.
As you can hear, there is one main melody. All of the harmonies have a relationship with the main melody, but there are also relationships between the harmonies themselves that dance around. Less set and determined, but no less beautiful. Within the Song of the Ainur, we can view Iluvatar's original theme as the Cantus Firmus. It was the original, stable melody that all of the singers knew. Through harmony with this Cantus Firmus, the Ainur got to know parts of Iluvatar's mind. But through this collective polyphonic improvisation, they formed relationships with each other as well, bound together by the common thread of Iluvatar's Cantus Firmus. These relationships were the lifeblood that allowed the music to flow, and the more and I knew hears of another's music, the more their reciprocal knowledge increases. But these newly formed relationships are thrown into jeopardy when Melkor abandons the Cantus Firmus entirely. Melkor is the Ainu with the most power and knowledge, and he seeks to increase the power and glory of his part. Melkor goes into the shadows to try and seek the Flame Imperishable, the original creative power that allowed Iluvatar to make the Ainur. He's unable to fully grasp it though, and the music that he creates weaves discord into the song of the Ainur. The Ainur's harmony is compromised, and conflict arises between Iluvatar's creation that will never be fully resolved until the end of time. Despite this deviation from the original plan, Iluvatar takes Melkor's betrayal in stride and integrates this new, discordant music into the theme. New harmonies arise that are enriched, not degraded by this discord. The relationships that the Ainur have created are strengthened by this betrayal, and Melkor's theme is put to shame. Melkor's theme had now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated, and it had little harmony, but rather a clamorous unison, as of many trumpets braying upon few notes. Within the uninspired prison of Melkor's theme, there is no relationship, no knowing, just vanity, pride, and noise. At the end of the song, Iluvatar raises his hands, and in one chord, deeper than the abyss and higher than the firmament, piercing as the light of the eye of Iluvatar, the music ceased. Iluvatar concludes his masterpiece with one last moment of harmony a great chord that means the end of all things. He then steps back and reveals to the Ainur the incredible creative power of their music. Through their song, their knowledge, and their relationship of one another, the world has come into being. They have written out history itself, with all of its beauty, pain, and conflict, and now will watch it play out before them. Some of the Ainur descended into Arda and became known as the Valar. They each have some knowledge of Iluvatar's plan, and they hope to use this knowledge to hold back Melkor's evil and help the newly created people of Arda. From its first breath, Tolkien's world is made real by the power of music. It is both creative and relational, and its strains have written out the very sinews of the world. But music is not only present in the beginning of Tolkien's world, it continues to play an active role in the tales that unfold. We see Tolkien's music reach the zenith of its power and beauty in the mythic tale of Beren and Luthien. Tolkien's heroine Luthien is the elven princess of a woodland kingdom. She's the daughter of Melian, who is one of the Ainu that sang in the Ainu Lindale. So Luthien holds within herself part of the flame imperishable that inspired the first song. Luthien spends her time I'm delighting in the music within her, dancing and singing in the forest. When winter passed, she came again, and her song released the sudden spring, like rising lark and falling rain and melting water bubbling. Her music has the power to bring about spring, echoing the creative power that we saw in the Ainu Lindale, and showing that she has been touched by some of this divine inspiration. Beren, a troubled human warrior, stumbles across her dancing and is instantly enthralled. He seeks her out, and they fall madly in love. Beren is drawn to the power of her spirit and her otherworldly beauty, and Luthien is drawn in by his earthiness and his inherent human qualities. Their dedication is put to the Test when Luthien's father learns of their relationship, and sends Beren on an impossible quest to prove his love, hoping that the quest will lead to his demise. He is to take a gem from the crown of Melkor himself, who has fought with the Valar and has now been named Morgoth, 
or the Black Foe. Baron begins the quest without hesitation, but Luthien is kept behind by her father, who imprisons her in a high tower. She is desperate to follow after Baron and save him, so she sings a spell that causes her black hair to grow incredibly long. She weaves her hair into a magical cloak that allows her to pass invisibly out of bondage to save Baron. Tolkien deliberately intertwines magic and music in Luthien's character. It's not that her songs cast spells or that her music sounds like magic. They are simply one in the same. The creative power of the song of the Ainur made manifest. Her music possesses a physical authority and command that is unparalleled. Luthien finds that Baron has been imprisoned by Sauron, a servant of Morgoth, and she speaks a spell so powerful that Sauron flees in direct disobedience to Morgoth's orders. With Sauron gone, she throws open her arms and sings. The hill trembled, the citadel crumbled, and its towers fell. The rocks yawned and the bridge broke and Syrian spumed in sudden smoke. Luthien's song, made strong by the bond that she shares with Beren, is strong enough to shatter stone, and Sauron's citadel is razed to the ground, freeing all those who were trapped inside. She and Beren are reunited, and they continue their quest together. Luthien disguises them, allowing them to sneak past Morgoth's armies and into his hall, but Morgoth recognizes them even through the Veil of Magic. Luthien steps out before him and offers to sing for him. Although Morgoth knows that there may be power in her music, he pridefully disregards this and tells her to sing. Down crumpled orc and balrog proud, all eyes were quenched, all heads were bowed. The fires of heart and maw were stilled, and ever like a bird she thrilled. Above a lightless world forlorn, in ecstasy enchanted born. Luthien puts Morgoth's mighty armies to sleep in an instant, but Morgoth stubbornly remains, his eyes burning with foul fire. However, Luthien is infused with the power of the flame imperishable, that thing that Morgoth could never fully control, and eventually she overpowers even him. Then flaring suddenly, his eyes fell, down, down upon the floors of hell. The dark and mighty head was bowed like mountain top beneath a cloud. The shoulders foundered, the vast form crashed, as in an overwhelming storm. Huge cliffs in ruins slide and fall, and prone lay Morgoth in his hall. Morgoth, who spat on the feet of the creator himself, is flattened to the floor of his own hall by Luthien. Luthien, who weaves together the strength of the song of the Ainur and the worldliness of her blood. She is made impossibly strong by love, and none of Morgoth's bellowing or pride could ever overcome that. Luthien's will remains strong, even when Baron is later brought before her dead. Though she is immortal, she spirals into grief, and her soul goes to the halls of Mandos the Valar who is the Lord of the Dead. Her beauty was more than beauty, and her sorrow deeper than their sorrows, and she knelt before Mandos and sang to him. Luthien sings a song of mourning so profoundly sorrowful that it is still sung in the halls and holy places of Middle-earth. Mandos is moved by her song and allows her a choice. She can pass on to Valinor, which is more or less heaven for elves, but go there alone. Alternatively, she and Beren could both return to life as mortals, live one lifetime together, and die, never to return. Luthien, of course, chooses to be with Beren, and forsakes her immortality. She dies, but is never forgotten, her legacy passed down in blood and song. Tolkien is showing us that music isn't just creative and relational, it is made stronger by one's humanity. Luthien bears the strength of the flame imperishable, but the power of her love makes her unstoppable, humbling those who were not humbled in the original song and defying the very gates of death. While Luthien's tale is by far the most profound and specific example 
example of Tolkien's music, it's far from the end of the story. Tolkien's firstborn, the elves, call themselves the Quendi when they first awake. Quendi means speaker, and they use this term to set themselves apart from the rest of creation, which didn't have the ability to speak or sing. Immediately, they perceive their music as something special. According to the Judeo-Christian tradition, humankind was created in the image and likeness of God. When Tolkien depicts elves as having the same affinity for music as their creator, he indicates that they were also created in the image and likeness of their god, which meant that they were able to communicate as the Ainur did, with voices and music. The elves' music doesn't have the same power as the Ainur's, but it contains echoes of it, able to create specific images in a person's mind. Their music is a heightened form of communication, linked inherently with language itself. They use music as a way to pass down myth and history through the decades. Though he may not have been the, uh, poster child of elven values, Feanor, the primary antagonist of the Silmarillion, gives us an interesting insight on the elves' perspective on music. After he commits the first kinslaying, killing the Teleri elves at Alquande, he is given a curse called the Doom of the Noldor. As the name suggests, one of the Valar prophecies that Feanor's actions will bring about tears unnumbered, and that Feanor and all of his descendants will never escape the shade of death. In response to this rather threatening pronouncement, Feanor says that the deeds that we do shall be the matter of song in the last days of Arda. This suggests that the stories that will be sung of his actions will somehow make up for the boundless suffering that he and his descendants are going to have to endure. Though his tears will be unnumbered, they will never be forgotten kept eternally alive by the tones of songs. The second born of Iluvatar, humankind, had a similar relationship to this aspect of song. Feanor's sentiment is echoed by Theoden, king of Rohan, centuries later, when he tells Aragorn that if their efforts at Helm's Deep fails, they should make such an end as will be worth a song. Once again, rather than despairing that death is coming, he seeks to make it a death that will be an example in history, story, and song. Though men and elves both use music to remember their history and tales, there is a distinct difference between the music of elves and the music of men. I'll admit, this is a part of the legendarium that I am still trying to wrap my head around, so if any of you have a better understanding of it, feel free to let me know in the comments below. Though men were born decades after the elves, Iluvatar granted them something called the Gift of Iluvatar. It's multifaceted, but it essentially allows humans to move beyond the confines of the created world. The elves are confined within creation, and thus they cannot die. They will live in some form until the end of the created world. When men die, however, their souls go elsewhere, somewhere that not even the Valar are aware of. This also means that they exist somewhere beyond the song of the Ainur. The song that had been revealed to the Ainur did not encompass humankind or any of their later deeds, actions, or destiny. This leaves them with a sort of autonomy beyond that of the elves. Their ultimate fate isn't known by the Valar. For the sake of this discussion, it also means that their music lacks the magic that the elves had, as they are in some ways separate from the Song of the Ainur. Still, when the elf Finrod Felagund first finds humans, he finds them singing for gladness. Despite the lack of magic in their music, they have a deep reverence for song. One of the characters that exemplifies this human relationship to music is Aragorn. Of course, Aragorn isn't, like, completely human, but bear with me. <laughs> Aragorn is born out of a lineage of music. He's descended from the Dúnedain, who were in turn descended from Melian, who was Luthien's mother, and a Valar. Aragorn grew up within the halls of Elrond, which were known for their music, but he is still distinctly mortal and bestowed with the gift of Iluvatar. This connection to the magical music of Arda allows him to be the perfect mediator between elf and humankind. When he meets Arwen, he is singing the song of Beren and Luthien, and their romance is seen as a reflection of that epic poem. He tells the same story to the hobbits on Weathertop, maintaining the tradition of stories being passed on through music. Aragorn sings a song of mourning after Boromir's death, and he is welcomed to the throne of Gondor with a great deal of fanfare and music. Aragorn's music is never shown to have the creative and literally magical spark that we see in the Song of the Ainur, the powers of Luthien, or the music of the elves, but it reveals a shift in the role of music in Tolkien's world. It loses the literal magic of the original song, but has found its own magic in its ability to strengthen relationships between people and past 
down stories. The story of Middle-earth is a bittersweet one. The original magic from the Song of the Ainur is slowly fading away. The world of myth and epic war that we see in the Silmarillion is slowly becoming more and more like our own modern, non-magical world. And yet, the denizens of Middle-earth have far from forgotten their musical heritage. The hobbits are particularly instrumental in granting music its new magic. Music is their culture. It's stories told around crackling fires, whistled tunes on long dirt roads. Music is how the hobbits transmit the essential elements of their culture from one person to another. Their songs don't erase citadels or beat down the doors of death, but they offer a respite from the humdrum of everyday life, a chance to connect with others and to the world. We see this in the films when Merry and Pippin dance and sing with the soldiers of Rohan after the Battle of Helm's Deep. Their song strengthens their bond to the community and allows them to pass on some element of Hobbit culture. Hobbits originate from this massive, magical, creative music at the beginning of the world and have turned it into their language. And in that way, it remains magical, able to tell stories and create relationships just as it did in the beginning. Bilbo tells Sam, Frodo, and the other hobbits of his adventures oftentimes through song. Frodo later carries on this tradition, writing of his own adventure in story and song. For the hobbits, turning their life into music is a sacred thing, a way to preserve their memory and teach later generations. Here, we see the way that Tolkien himself used music to create magic. Tolkien loved words for their own sake. As a dedicated philologist, he found music within them, and he loved to create languages simply for how beautiful they would sound. Middle-earth itself was born out of his desire to create a world in which his invented language could plant itself and flourish. For Tolkien, language was twofold, the meaning of the word and the sheer beauty of the sound of the word. This can be seen not only in his invented languages, but in his prose. He uses the sounds and shapes of English words combined with those of his own invented languages to create the illusion of time, place, weather, emotion, and the depth of history. Tolkien's stories aren't just the plot, characters, and places. They are the words he uses to create these things. Their shapes and sounds, and how these shapes and sounds make a magic of their very own. Because of this, adapting Tolkien's work into another medium is an impossible task. When the magic of the work comes from the beauty of how it was written, there's no way to perfectly translate this magic into another form, but... In my opinion, Peter Jackson's movies come pretty close. Much of the beauty of this adaptation comes from the creator's reverence towards the original work. It's impossible to bring all the magic of Tolkien's prose to the screen, but they did what they could, filling the spaces of their film with some of the most beautiful music in cinematic history. I would play some of it for you now, but I really don't want to get sued. Howard Shore's music makes deft use of leitmotifs, musical themes, that establish a place, time, and depth of history. In the soft flutes of Hobbiton, we feel all of the cozy warmth of the Shire. The fierce strings of Rohan's theme demonstrate the steely pride of its people and remind us of the historical precedents behind their culture. The braying horns of Mordor's gates remind us of all of the pain and greed contained within. Tolkien used words to shape Middle-earth, and Howard Shore's score does the same. Considering the role that music had in Tolkien's stories, I find it impossible to believe that Tolkien didn't also view music as magic in his personal life. He was known to sing often at mass and to his children, but most importantly, we know that music was very important to his wife, Edith. Edith Mary Tolkien had a very difficult upbringing, but seemed to find solace in music. Her mother died when she was 14, and she was sent to a boarding school run by two sisters who had studied music in Dresden, Germany. At this boarding school, Edith learned how to play piano and fell deeply in love with it. And after they had had their first child, she and Tolkien would go on walks together. Near Ruse, they found a small wood with an undergrowth of hemlock, and there they wandered. Ronald recalled of Edith as she was at the time. Her hair was raven, her skin clear, her eyes bright, and she could sing and dance. 
Edith was Tolkien's Luthien, that divinely inspired musician who could turn open the gates of hell with the power of her song. Middle Earth is Tolkien's love letter to music and the power that it has in the world. It may not ruin stone citadels or bring whole universes into being, but it does have the ability to create new worlds in our minds, to pass on stories, and to bring us closer to those around us. Tolkien seems to have found this in his wife, and felt that he was the mortal man, graced with the joy of watching her dance among the hemlocks. When Tolkien and his wife died, the names Beren and Luthien were placed on their gravestones, the final chord to their song, the song that brought all of Middle-earth into being. I have spent a lot of my life wishing that the real world was more like Middle-earth, and maybe I always will. But there's solace in Tolkien's message because the magic that he finds in music is real. Music can be a window into another world, a look through history, and a way to find closer relationships with the people around us. It's a subtle and secret magic, ever present and just waiting to be recognized. I had so much fun working on this video. Longer projects like this are very, very time consuming, so I hope you guys like them. Let me know what you thought in the comments and if you learned anything new. I do recognize that I skipped over Tom Bombadil in this episode. I originally had three pages written for him, but he needs a whole video of his own, so expect that to be coming down the pipeline. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss that video or any of my other videos when they come out. Like this video if you had fun and if you feel like donating a few dollars to the channel, the link to my Kofi virtual tip jar is in the description below. Thanks for hanging out with me this week, and I hope that you all have a very happy hobbity day.